Welcome to the keynote podcast from Kingdom Faith. Today's message is by Pastor Colin Urquhart. This morning we're going to talk about the anointing. God's been talking to us a lot in recent weeks about honoring the anointing on our own lives, on one another, on those He has placed over us. This morning, we're going to talk about serving the anointing. God has anointed us to serve. No matter what the particular nature of the anointing on our lives, it's always to serve. But in using the anointing to serve, we need to serve the anointing. Now, what does that mean? John tells us that we have the anointing of the Holy One and that anointing abides, it remains, it has come to stay with us. So, we have to serve the anointing of the Holy One. Now, Jesus is the Christ, or the Messiah, and as you know, that means the Anointed One. So, God has anointed us to serve the Anointed One. In fact, it is the Anointed One who has anointed us to serve the Anointed One. And what you understand from all of this is that it's all about anointing. That without anointing, we're nowhere because the anointing is the life and power of God, of His Spirit, of Christ in our lives. Now, we know that the nature of the anointing that he gives to different people will be different, although always of the same spirit. So the apostle has his anointing, the prophet has his anointing, the evangelist, the pastor, the teacher, these are five different anointings. And what is obvious from what Paul says in Ephesians 4 is that those five anointings operating together will equip the saints for works of service that the body of Christ may be built up, that all may come to a unity in the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God so that that they will be able to take hold of the fullness of the life for which God has taken hold of them. So we see these different anointings, and they are different anointings, uh, but we see them all part of the same spirit, all coming from the same source, so that all will work together for the common good. Now, what that means is that God anoints individuals in different ways, in order that they may serve the central anointing. That there has to be a corporate anointing, an anointing on the body of Christ in any particular place. You see, from the moment that we're born again, God puts us in a body where we have to relate to others. Now, part of the reason for that is Jesus says we are to love one another as he has loved us, then the world will know that we're his disciples and the world will believe. So we cannot be a faithful witness outside of the context of the body of which we are a part. But then you see he also says that we, all these various anointings are complementary. In other words, we need each other. Paul 
enforces that when he talks about the body being, having, being like the human body, having different parts, each with their own specific function, but the body needs all of them. The body needs eyes, needs ears, needs hands, needs feet, if it's to be a healthy body. This is why the idea of an independent Christian is a nonsense biblically, because an independent Christian cannot have the whole variety of anointings that are necessary. He cannot be serving a central corporate anointing, and he cannot be the whole body. Hello. So, <clears throat> God has put us deliberately from the moment that we're born again into a social context. And then he puts his body in the world. Now we know that holy means to be called and set apart for God. So the very fact that he anoints us and gives us his Holy Spirit is evidence of that call. It's also a guarantee of the inheritance that is to come. But it's first of all the evidence that God has called us, chosen us, set us apart to, in order to fulfill the particular place or part that he has for each of us in serving the corporate anointing. Right. Now, this is a matter of attitude. Heart attitude. You are not there to serve your own anointing. You're not there to raise yourself up in ministry. You're not there for everybody to focus on your anointing. You're there for your anointing to serve the central corporate anointing that is Christ. You see, he is that central corporate anointing. And the measure to which we communicate Christ to the world is dependent, therefore, upon, if you like, the power or the intensity of that central corporate anointing. So each one of us has a contribution to make to that. Now, in order for us to be faithful in that, we have to recognize the anointing on our own lives. And we have to learn to understand why God has given us that particular anointing. Now, the nature of anointing can change. <laughs> it can develop. And God can anoint us for specific tasks that are outside our normal anointing. In 1970, when the revival began in Luton, nobody was born again in the congregation when we started. So, for a period of months, God anointed me to do just about everything. Because the people needed to come to the Lord, get filled with the Holy Spirit, and be released in ministry. But for a period of months, while this sort of process began, and one group of people after another came to the Lord... I was in a position where I had to be the preacher, the teacher, the healer, the one with, with the, the boldness of faith, the one who is leading, the one who is prophesying, the one... But, you see, rapidly that changed as more and more people got anointed, learned how to function in that anointing, so that after a few months, everybody was praying for the sick. And miracles were happening without me having to be involved. 
And uh, I can remember at the time saying, Lord, send us some leaders. And God said, no, no, no. If I send you leaders, that will ruin what I'm doing here. You've got to raise up your own leaders. Even though they were so young and immature in the faith, raise up your own leaders. Train your own leaders. And you see, what I saw was the anointing upon different people developing as they were given more and more responsibility. Well, they were given more responsibility according to their anointing. And as they were given that responsibility, so the anointing increased. Why? Because people began to function in the good of what God had given them. So I was very relieved, you see, that when the anointing could be a much more corporate thing than, than just the anointing on my life. Now, I mention that because sometimes we're in situations where there isn't anybody else around that's anointed. And something has to be done, so God will anoint you to do it. Now, it doesn't mean that's what he wants you to do all the time. He will anoint you because of the situation, because of the specific need. So we must always be ready for that. And even if you're confronted with something that you think is outside your anointing, that doesn't mean that God won't anoint you to do it. It's It's no use saying, well, this isn't me. Well, it's got to be you if God has put you in that situation. So God God will give you, if you like, a temporary anointing for that particular situation. But quite apart from that, what we will see developing, and what those of you who are students will see developing over a course of time, what the nature of your anointing is. Because the call of God and the anointing and the faith that go with the call all go together. Those three things, the call, the faith, the anointing. They're all related. God will give you faith to fulfill your call and the anointing to do it. Anybody in this morning? So, God is developing your anointing. Now, there are various ways in which that anointing will develop. First and foremost... It's through the way you meet with him. Hello? You see, sometimes you will feel that God has just done something new and fresh in your life. That's, if you like, looking at it from the angle of our experience. What is usually happening is that through some encounter with the Lord, something of that anointing he's already put on our lives is released. Now, I mean, it can be either. God can come upon us again as he he filled with the Holy Spirit the the disciples in Acts 2 and Acts 4. The same people got filled again in Acts 4 as were filled in Acts 2. So <clears throat> the Holy Spirit can surely come upon us more than once. He can keep coming upon us. But his purpose is to release more and more of the activity of the Spirit in our lives. So therefore we become less dependent on ourselves, more dependent upon the anointing. Now why is that important? It's because the anointing breaks the yoke. Now, the anointing breaks any yokes on our own lives, but then the anointing will break the yoke that is on the lives of other people around us. And as we communicate the gospel, that is what God, God calls us to do, to remove the obstacles out of the way of the people. And the anointing breaks those yokes of oppression. The anointing enables those yokes to be fulfilled. The anointing enables us to cut away the drag anchors that God was talking to us about last week. Because those are obstacles, but they're not obstacles in front of us. They're obstacles behind us 
They're the obstacles of those that want to pull us back and hinder us from really moving ahead in the walk of God. But the anointing, you see, breaks that yoke, breaks whatever is holding us back so that there's nothing to impede our progress in the Lord, nothing to hinder the development of the anointing, the release of more and more of the anointing in our lives. So, praise God, he has already anointed you. Now, the the other way in which the anointing, uh, or another way in which the anointing develops, is by honoring that anointing. By recognizing that what is valuable to God about you is the anointing that he has placed on you. What will serve the Lord is the putting to use of that anointing. Because, you see, it's only through the anointing that we can bear fruit that will last. What we do uh, without dependence upon that anointing will never bear lasting fruit. It might appear to be fruitful at the time, but it won't bear lasting fruit. And the reason for that is the Spirit is eternal. He is the eternal one. He is eternal life. And therefore what he does in and through us always has an eternal dimension. It is of eternal significance. Whether we can determine how or why that is, uh, that's not the point. If it's the work of the Spirit, he will always work according to God's eternal plan. The Holy Spirit will never cause you to do anything outside the plan of God. So the way to keep in the plan of God is to keep submitted to the Holy Spirit. Because if we obey the Spirit, he will keep us in the purpose of God. He will keep us in the plan of God. He will keep us moving ahead in the way that God intends. The third way in which we develop the anointing is by using it. Uh, I mean, this is, this is the, the case with, with, with anything. Now, my wife and I have a totally different outlook on what you do with new clothes when you bought them. My wife sticks them in the cupboard and you wait with bated breath for weeks before they see the light of day. If I buy anything, I wear it. (laughs) Because to me, the idea of buying clothes is to wear the clothes. Come on. (laughs) But my wife and I are in great unity about this. It's just that we have a different philosophy. Uh, Her new clothes are to be put away and to be kept for some special occasion. My new clothes I wear and put on. I have this philosophy that if you buy clothes, you are supposed to wear them and not keep them. It's a little bit like the anointing. I don't judge or criticize my wife for keeping her clothes because when she does get round to putting them on, she looks very nice. But if we have the anointing, we have to use the anointing. That's it. Come on. Now, of course, the way in which we use it will develop as the anointing develops. But you see, it requires us in ourselves being submitted to the Lord, being submitted to the anointing, being submitted to the Holy Spirit. So you see, in all these ways we enable the anointing on our lives to develop. Now, there are some drag anchors, personal ones, that can hold us back. The most common one is a desire to show off. 
a desire to be recognized, a desire to be appreciated, a desire for people to see what you can do with your anointing. That is a hindrance to the developing of the anointing because God raises up the humble, but he pulls down the proud. While you yourself want to be the focus of attention, the anointing cannot develop. Why? Because the anointing is Christ in you. So the focus needs to be on him, and God raises up the humble. We're going to look at some scripture in a minute to see how God says all this prophetically, hundreds of years before the Spirit was given. Because this is the way of the Lord. So... We do not want to become the object of admiration. Now, we are all learning how important it is to honor one another. But, you see, that's because we do not want to honor ourselves. Or to be honored ourselves, but we want to give honor. Mm Mm-hmm. Now, of course, it is important that we are ourselves honored by others and that we honor the anointing on our own life. But that's not because we want to make ourselves the object of attention. The more selfless a person is, the more that person's anointing can come through in his or her life. Which is why Jesus said if anyone denies himself, what what does it mean to deny yourself? Well, you become selfless. Your focus isn't on yourself. It isn't on wanting to build yourself up. It isn't on your ministry but it's on the ministry of the Lord in you and through you. And of course, ultimately, this is a matter of the heart. How much we really desire to be recognized ourselves and how much we are truly living for the glory of God. It is a matter of where the heart is. Now, one of the reasons that you have heard me say before that the thing I, I dread hearing, especially about sort of young students who come here, is when people say he or she has such potential. When I hear somebody say that, it's not good news, it's bad news. Right. Uh, because, you see, I've seen so many students go through here that had, in quotes, potential that never, ever gets realized. And the reason why it doesn't get realized is because of pride. Even as I'm speaking, I can think of one or two people from a long time ago, so... Most of you wouldn't even know them. But I can think, I'm thinking of one person in particular who was a very, very anointed and able young man who, if his gift had been consecrated to God, would have made waves. But his life turned out to be a disaster. And everybody around here said he had such potential. When he was a student, all those that were going out in ministry, and we used to have a lot more teams going out all the time than we have now, everybody wanted to take this guy as part of the team. And perhaps that was the trouble, you see. He got proud. And, th- and, and uh, because he was so able in the natural as well as, as uh, spiritually, his anointing never developed. 
So people were saying at the end of his time here, because he, well, no, I don't need to go into detail, but he was saying at the end of the same time exactly what they were saying at the beginning. He has such potential. But when is potential going to be realized? When you put your anointing to use. You see, I don't want people to say of the students, he or she has such potential. I want people to say, look how God is using him. Look how God is using her. Already. Now, as a student. Because if God is using us, then that means we are beginning to learn how to flow in the anointing. Are you there? So, <clears throat> we've all got to have a healthy attitude towards ourselves because we've got a healthy attitude towards God and therefore towards others. Yeah. See, one of, the, one of the reasons that God throws everybody together in a situation like this is for everybody to learn how they need and can benefit from the anointing that is on others around you. It's not just a question of appreciating them as people, but seeing what they are anointed to do. Now, you will already be discovering that if you want to talk through some, something, who to go to. I don't mean on the staff, I mean among the students. If you want... If you want an ear to listen, a shoulder to lean on, you know who to go to. You know who you can trust. You know who will stop and listen and be concerned and care about you. Nobody has to tell you. You know where to go. Because already you see a particular anointing or a particular grace upon those people. And this is just one of the ways, it's just an example of how we can learn to appreciate each other. If you want to be encouraged, you know who to go to. You know who to hang around because this person is an encourager. And just to be with them will encourage you, will lift you out of whatever you're in at the time that causes you to need encouragement. And what we all need to be thankful for is the ways in which we can serve one another because of the anointing that others will recognize in us whatever the nature of our particular anointing is and will want to draw upon that anointing. It's not simply that they want to be near you or, or look to you for some help or for some fellowship or encouragement. They recognize something of the Spirit upon you. Some years ago... Uh, we had um, a, a group of over 20, there are about 23 of them, I think, disciples that, are, that I di disciple. This was before we had a, a second year. And at the end, end of the first year, I had this group for a year, and I personally discipled them, met with them every week. Now, they're actually a very high-powered bunch. Um, they have gone on to do all kinds of things. Uh, most of them have been pastors or in full-time ministry and doing uh, a number of different things. But it was very... Because I got so involved with this particular group, I, I would meet with them, they would travel with me, they would... Uh, they were really being discipled in the biblical sense. I got to know them a lot better than I get to know the students usually. And... Uh, the interesting thing was to watch the dynamics among this group develop. You saw the leaders emerge. 
You saw those who had the anointing of wisdom on their lives because, you know, they were learning, not to come to me, they were learning how to develop the anointing on their lives. This is part of discipleship. You saw the leaders emerge. You saw those with wisdom. You saw the encouragers. You saw the clowns. And the clowns had their ministry making people laugh. And actually, it's good to have the odd clown around. It's just that this year, we've got so many of them. But (laughs) 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 mentioning no names, of course. (laughs) But you see, you, you see... Not, not just people in their natural giftings, but you see people beginning to recognize the anointing on each other's lives. And when I was having the one-to-one times with them, I would talk to them not only about themselves, but about the other disciples in this group. And I would say to them, you know, uh, who do you relate? What, when, when do you go to so and so? What contact do you have with so and so? It was fascinating, you see, just to see the way that they were learning to depend on one another and how their lives were being enriched by that. That it wasn't that they were all learning to be self contained units because they were disciples of the Lord. But no, they were learning how to be a body of people, each with their distinctive gifts, each able to depend upon one another without losing any self-esteem themselves. That it was a positive thing to be able to do instead of having that pride which says, I've got to manage this myself. Hello. And you see, we are to function as a body. Each one of us is to be responsible. We're responsible for ourselves. We can't place that responsibility on anybody else. But at the same time, we need one another in order to grow and develop in the way that God intends. So this process will be going on even among you as students, uh, even though I'm personally not involved closely in it, but it will be happening because it's a, a sort of the outworking of the anointing of the Holy Spirit among you, even though you may not be conscious that that is actually the reason why certain things develop in the way that they do. Now, as you use the anointing of love and grace, because it doesn't matter what the nature of the anointing, there are certain things you see that always accompany anointing. The anointing is always to be expressed in love, always to be expressed with faith, always to be expressed through prayer. Hello. Uh, So, you know, there are those things that are common to every kind of anointing. But at the same time, you begin to see the ways in which God uses you. Now, what you don't need to do is try to categorize yourself. Am I a pastor? Am I a teacher? Am I an evangelist? You're probably nothing at present. But it's what... (laughs) It's what God wants you to become. Come on. Yeah. I mean, you're an anointed one. I don't say you're nothing, but you're an anointed one. But it's what God will call us to develop. Yeah. Yeah. It's good. It's been good as I've been going around to the, the various uh, leaders groups in, in, the region, in the regions over the last few weeks to see how the third-year students are getting on that they have grown and developed immensely and are being so appreciated 
I can see what's going to happen that at the end of the year the pastors won't want them to go because they're becoming so integrated into the church and in the ministry of the various churches where they are. And you see, what, what you see is all that they've been learning here and the anointing that God has put on their lives, now that anointing is being used. They're just growing, they're blossoming, they're getting a confidence in God that you could see could happen, but now is happening. And uh, if you talk to every one of them, they will say that this has happened because they have been constantly taken out of their comfort zone. (laughs) Because, you see, if you're in your comfort zone, you don't need to depend upon anointing. And they will all say that the way they have been, uh, that they've grown and developed is by being made to do things or being put in a situation where they are asked to do things that they felt they couldn't do. Right. Which is how you learn to depend upon the anointing instead of your ability. And so, you know, you you can even discover that instead of having to get a word from God because you've got to preach you begin to enjoy preaching and looking forward to the next time when you'll be asked to preach. <laughs> you see, you know, yes, I can see some of the nervous smiles there. You're, you're not all at that point yet. So <laughs> if I pointed to one of you and asked you to come forward and finish this message this morning, <laughs> you would die a thousand deaths before you got to the front here. But once there's a a confidence, you see, that God will use you and God will speak through you, you won't say, well, let me go away and pray for a few minutes because you will just come forward and speak. Some of you have got the gift to do that already. I know one or two of you I could call forward now and you would speak. You would just continue to flow with the anointing because you've got that particular kind of anointing on your life. And you do it without any hassle. You wouldn't say, well, I need to go away and pray for half an hour. You'd just come forward and speak. For others of you, that would be way beyond what you considered your ability to be. Therefore, you wouldn't do it because you don't have the faith to do it. And this is how, as we develop the anointing, we develop in faith. Because it's exercising our faith that enables us to depend upon the anointing. Are we getting something from all this this morning? Now, let's turn to Isaiah 57. And we'll see how all this ties in with some scripture, then we're going to pray. Now, just before we look at the scripture, I've got some good news for you. God is going to begin to release us in anointing in a new way this morning that is going to lead us into the move of God that he's been talking about. This is why right at the beginning you said whatever I asked you to say. This is it. Right out of the blue, God said to me this morning, this is it. The drag anchors have been cut away, this is it. Now you can motor, now you can go forward. It doesn't mean everything's going to happen in one morning, but God's going to kickstart something. I mean, there's a sense in which he's been doing that. But the prophetic conference that we had see, a few days ago was such a confirmation of what God has been saying and doing here. It's like, you know, that that's God has declared it, God has spoken it, God has confirmed it. Now 
we get into it. Right, I'm in verse 14. And it will be said, build up, build up, prepare the road. Remove the obstacles out of the way of my people. That's what God has been doing in these last weeks. The obstacles have been removed. Amen? For this is what the high and lofty one says, he who lives forever, whose name is holy. I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit, the humble. I live with the humble, not with the proud. I live with the humble. Why? To revive the spirit of the humble. To revive the heart of the humble. You want to be revived? Just humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. There's no mystical answer as to how you get revived. You just humble yourself before God. Because he dwells with the humble. And revival is simply living in such a sense of the presence of God that he takes over. So the more you humble yourself before God, the more he takes over and the more revival happens in your life. It's very simple. I will not accuse forever, nor will I always be angry, for then the spirit of man will grow faint before me, the breath of man that I have created. I was enraged by his sinful greed. I punished him and hid my face in anger. Yet he kept on in his willful ways. I have seen his ways, but I will heal him. I will guide him and restore comfort or strength to him, creating praise on the lips of the mourners in Israel. Peace, peace to those far and near, says the Lord, and I will heal them. But there's no peace for the wicked. There's no peace for the rebellious. There's no peace for those who withstand the purpose of God. There's no peace for the proud. So then at the beginning of verse, uh, of chapter 58, shout it aloud! It's time to shout aloud. And do not hold back. Raise your voice like a trumpet. But you see, if you're going to raise your voice like a trumpet, you've got to sound a clear note, the scripture says. And that clear note is the voice of God. And you see, what, what I've had to raise my voice in the last few months. Yeah. And what did I have to do, first of all, to declare to my people their rebellion? These last few weeks have been very interesting, haven't they? But God has had to deal with rebellious elements in the lives of some people. And it's interesting, you see, because it says, For day after day they seek me out, they seem eager to know my ways. (laughs) And the rebellious can be like that. They seem to be something, but they're not. Um, because, you know, even though, even though they may be doing all the spiritual things like fasting, yet at the same time, what is actually going on in their lives is against the purposes of God and not in fulfillment of his purposes. <coughs> so God asks in verse 5, is this the kind of fast I have chosen, only a day for a man to humble himself, you know, only to miss your meals in the week before the conference is it only for bowing one's head like a reed and for lying on sackcloth and ashes is that what you call a fast a day acceptable to the Lord is not this the kind of fasting I have chosen now you see here is the anointing here is the anointing you remember Jesus said the spirit of the, of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me too then you get the list of things well you, you think of that list of things in relation to what God says here. To loose. Now, we've, we've been talking, Clive, 
was talking the other day about that. It's unbinding. In Scripture, to loose is not just to release something, it's to unbind something. So you unbind people from the chains of injustice. Now, what unbinds them? The anointing. You have the anointing to unbind, to release, to loose, in that sense, people from the chains of injustice. To untie. You see, that's what this word loose. Jesus said, you know, whatever you loose on earth will have been loosed in heaven. Uh, It's the same thing. You untie the cords of the yoke. You break the yoke off people's lives. See, because you have the anointing, but shatter. Actually, the, the word mean, doesn't mean to break the yoke. It means to shatter the yoke. Right. You know, if you, if you break a yoke, you just break it in pieces. But shatter is like smashing a glass on the floor, so it breaks, to, it breaks up into a hundred different pieces. Well, that, that's, the, that's what the word means. You shatter the yoke. Because, you know, if you just break a yoke, I suppose you could try to repair it and bind it up and put it back on again. But if you shatter it, there's no way that you can have it back on. So we're called to shatter the yoke. Hallelujah. To set the oppressed free. You need the anointing to set the oppressed free, you see. Hello? Not just the anointing to preach to them, but you have the anointing to set them free. Or we as the body of Christ have the anointing to set them free. To break or shatter every yoke. Now you see, it doesn't mean you as an individual do that, but we as a body will. That it doesn't matter what the yoke, with that corporate anointing, if we all use our anointings to serve the corporate anointing, that corporate anointing will shatter every yoke. Is it not to share your food with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter when you see the naked to clothe him and not to turn away from your own flesh and blood? See, here is the serving. Using your anointing to serve. Using your anointing to bless. Using your anointing to give. And what will happen? Then your light will break forth like the dawn. And your healing will quickly appear. You see, if you need healing, start using your anointing to serve others. Absolutely. And then see how much healing happens in your life as a result. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help and he will say, here am I. Why? Because you're living in such close proximity really, in fellowship, in close unity with him. Are you there? If you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk, you see, God has nailed those things in recent weeks. And if you spend yourselves on behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will become like the noonday. See, some of you, if you think, this is the second term. Let Let me tell you something. Everybody has a great first term here because there's so much revelation. Then the second term, it's, oh, I don't know why it's so hard this term compared with last term. Uh It's because God's dealing with you. The good news is term three is victory. (laughs) (laughs) But that doesn't mean you long for the end of this term so you can then have a break and come back for the victory because you, you can't avoid the dealings of God. Amen. Then your light will rise in the darkness. Your night will become like the noonday. Just imagine that. You're in pitch black. And then suddenly it's noontime. And what, what God said to me this morning is the winter has passed. But spring will soon become summer. Why? Because God spoke to us, didn't he, the other day about the accelerating of what he was going to do. So the spring is very rapidly going to give birth to summer. It's going to be like going from winter to summer with a very, very little springtime. 
Is that all right? I mean, do you have faith for that? The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in a sun-scorched land. Wouldn't it be lovely to be in a sun-scorched land? (laughs) And will strengthen your frame. Now look, look, look. You will be like a well-watered garden. Let me tell you, let me tell you. That's you in the plural. It's not just you as an individual. You are not going to be a well-watered garden. I could think of a few things to say. Like a spring whose waters never fail. This is the corporate anointing. Amen? Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the age-old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restorer of streets with dwelling. Hallelujah. Verse 14. You will find your joy in the Lord and I will cause you to ride on the heights of the land and to feast on the inheritance of your father Jacob. The mouth of the Lord has spoken. So where does it all start? Well, it starts... I live in a high and holy place, but also with him who is contrite and lowly in spirit, to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite. The anointing is the anointing of the Holy One. To flow fully in that anointing means that you have to keep in with the Holy One because it's the anointing of the Holy One. So the more you humble yourself and meet with God as the Holy One, the more you are able to flow in that anointing. And keeping in that place with the Holy One prevents the pride. Prevents the look at me and the way God is using me kind of thought developing. Keeps you humble, keeps you broken before God. And the good thing about that is those who are broken before God will break yokes of other people. Amen? Let's all stand. Hallelujah. <clears throat> Praise God. Hallelujah. Now thank the Lord for the anointing. Thank him for the anointing. Thank him for the anointing on your life personally. You are one of the most privileged people on earth to carry the anointing. Praise you, Jesus. Thank you, Lord. And thank him for the anointing that is upon others around you. How you can be helped and encouraged and blessed through those anointings. Not just through the people that you like, but through the anointing that's on their lives. And why don't you tell the Lord, Lord, I want the anointing that you have placed on my life to develop. I want to see this anointing developing. I I want to flow in the fullness of what you have put onto my life and what you have put into me by the Spirit. Thank you, Lord, for the ways in which I already see evidence of that anointing, but Lord, I want the, the fullness of that anointing to be realized in my life. I don't want to be a person of potential, but a person of realization. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. 
So Lord, thank you that you have anointed me to serve. That I can serve others with this anointing. And Lord, I want to serve the corporate anointing. I want to put, I want to put my part into the pot. I, I'm not here just to preserve myself and to, to build up my self-esteem. I, I'm here to serve the corporate anointing. I want to serve the anointed one. I want to serve the Christ. I want to serve the Messiah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you that my anointing is part of the corporate anointing. And thank you, Lord, that as I submit my anointing to the corporate anointing, I can live in the power and strength of the corporate anointing and not just of my own anointing. And I give you glory, Lord, that I can do things beyond myself, even beyond my anointing, because I'm part of something bigger than myself. And I give you glory, Lord. I give you honor. I give you praise. Oh, bless you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Now, Lord, I thank you that the anointing shatters the yokes. So, Lord, I thank you that I'm yoked to Jesus. He says, take my yoke upon you and learn of me. The only one I'm yoked to is Jesus. I'm yoked to the anointed one. And every other yoke is shattered. And, Lord, we thank you that in that corporate anointing, Every other yoke is shattered over the whole of the body, over the whole of kingdom faith. Yokes of sickness are shattered. And we're going to see people's healing quickly appear. Thank you that every yoke of rebellion is shattered. Hallelujah. We praise you, Jesus. We give you glory, Lord. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you. Our voice can sound like a trumpet and say, Every yoke is shattered in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Pura tapara zata bakara zito balatuba. Bapara zata pareya zato bakara zito di zatuba. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Come on, Jesus. Pupara zata paria leto bakarazito ba. Brota paria zato bakarazito di zato ba. Brota paria zato bakarazito di zato ba. Yes, 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 yes. Bo para zata pare zato bakara zito ba. Bo para zata pare lera bakara zito di zato ba. Come on, Jesus, Lord, we thank you that we can loose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of every other yoke. Hallelujah! We can see people walking in freedom. Oh, thank you, Lord, that you change our darkness into the noontime. Oh, praise you, Lord, that our night will become like the noonday. Oh, we bless you, Lord. Thank you that winter is past. Not the physical season, but thank you, Lord, that, that the spiritual season of winter has passed. And now it's springtime and we see new things blossoming and blooming. 
and thank you that summer is going to come quickly. Oh, and thank you, Lord. We're going to see the fruit that it's going to be an amazing time, Lord, that as in some areas we just see the blossom forming, in other areas we see that it's harvest time already. We see the fruit is ready to pick. And Lord, we, we just thank you that we're going to see a multiplicity of things happening all at the same time as we all submit our anointings to you and, and to the cause of your kingdom, to building up that common, common uh, uh, anointing, that corporate anointing. And we bless you, Lord. We thank you, Lord that we seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and everything else shall be added to us. We praise you, Jesus. We bless you, Lord. We give you glory. We give you honor. Right now, I want you to do something prophetic. I want you just to, to wave goodbye, as if you were waving goodbye. You know, somebody's going off in a car. Just wave goodbye. Just, just do that now. And just say, goodbye every negative attitude. Goodbye every thought of unbelief. You're going down the road never to be seen again. You're not part of me any longer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Oh, we give you glory, Jesus. Praise you, Lord. Hallelujah. Thank you for listening to this Kingdom Faith podcast. We trust it's been an encouragement to you. For more information and resources by Kingdom Faith and for our other audio and video podcasts, please visit kingdomfaith.com.